Welcome to That Annuity Show, the podcast that will make you an expert in explaining annuities to your clients. Give us 30 minutes each week and we'll shave hours from your client presentations. Now, here's your host, Paul Tyler. Hi, this is Paul Tyler, and welcome to another episode of That Annuity Show. And today we've got a full complement of our hosts and co-hosts. Um, Mark, how are you? Doing great, Paul. Good morning. How are you? Uh, Will Moorcroft, how are you? We missed great. you the last couple of episodes. Great, great to be back. Yeah, and uh, uh, Ramsey, um, good to see you as usual. And do you want to introduce our uh, very uh, special guest we're honored to have on our show Absolutely. So, Paul, today, Paul, Mark, and and uh, uh, and Will, today we're we're honored to have with us uh, uh, Professor Moshe Ari Malevsky. We're going to call him Moshe today for his uh, for his instructions. Um, and you know, hopefully, many people in our audience will already have heard his name or know who he is. But for anybody that's, that's happened to somehow miss out, um, you know, Moshe Malevsky, Moshe uh, is is really in many ways one of the godfathers of, of longevity, longevity academia. And if you've been listening to our show, there have been any number of people that have been on our show over the course of the last six months or so, who at some point in time will make reference to or pay homage to, you know, having learned much of what they, uh, what they do from, from, uh, from Moshe. So we're very, we're very honored to have him here today. Uh, and we're going to uh, hopefully touch on a number of topics, but the, the biggest thing going on right now is that um, Moshe has just, just published a new book called Retirement Income Recipes in R. Now, Moshe is a professor at the University of Toronto, Schulich School of Business, and uh, has received any number of war awards, probably more than I can, I can mention in this, in this short intro. Um, but one of the key things that I saw was interesting. He was named by Investment Advisor Magazine as one of the 35 most influential people in the U.S. financial advisory business over the last 35 years. And he's also received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Retirement Industry Association. 65 peer-reviewed articles. This is his 15th book. And I think it just, I think it just came out very recently. So we're, we're delighted to have you here, Moshe. Um, and with that, um, I guess, get us started. Tell us a little bit about why you decided to write this book and you know, what, uh, what your main goals were in, in, in putting it together. So first of all, Ramsey, thank you very much for the uh, lovely introduction. I'm uh, honored to be on the show. Uh, you've had some great guests uh, and I'm glad to follow in their footsteps. Uh, in terms of the motivation for the book, I teach a course at the uh, Schulich School of Business. Uh, the teaching has actually been taking place right here in my office, obviously, for the last six months. We've been doing everything by Zoom, but I teach a graduate course and an undergraduate course on retirement income planning. So we have basic personal finance courses where we teach people about mortgages and life insurance and income taxes and you know how to figure out whether to buy or rent. Uh, but I designed a course that was exclusively focused on retirement income planning, uh, which as you know, is a very different beast than accumulation planning. You know, some of the risk metrics, uh, products that we use, the strategies, the, you know, just the language that we use in accumulation planning is very different than retirement income planning. So I started teaching a course to our students on retirement income planning. And we discussed things like sequencing risk, and we discussed things like annuities, and we discussed things like optimal withdrawal strategies, and so on and so forth. There just wasn't a good textbook to use. This is relatively new. The whole idea of decumulation is a new area. And, you know, there were great articles by uh, authors out there. You know, you mentioned Wade Fow earlier. He's done some great work. Uh, you know, uh, there's been others that have written. Michael Kitches would be another name that I'd say. You know, these have all put together a lot of articles, but there was no textbook. So that was number one. I needed a textbook. And number two, there's a growing movement uh, at the university, certainly in our business school, to teach students how to code, how to write code. Uh, there's a growing awareness. You talk to big software companies that they need more people who know how to write code, whether it's in Python or C or Fortran or the language that I decided to use, which is R, which is a freely available language uh, for coding snippets of things and perhaps even larger programs. So I decided to merge the two. So to answer your question, uh, I decided to write a textbook that would focus on retirement income planning, but I decided to do it in a way that we would be able to teach our students how to code in R so that they can go out into industry and work in the many shops, whether it's a you know, re registered investment advisor or whether it's Goldman Sachs or Merrill Lynch or some other place. Anybody working in the retirement income field has to be able to compute things. 
not just to sell things, but how to compute numbers and risk metrics. And the purpose of the book is to teach them how to do that in a transparent way, easily replicable way. So that when somebody says there's a 97% chance you'll have enough money, they actually know how to do it and how to compute it and how to replicate. So that is the long-winded answer to your question. Why did I write this book? I, I, I listen, I, I, I'm a f- absolute fan of R uh, and motion and, uh, Maybe you know. I'm sure some of the people are going to say, "R, uh, R, A, R, E." You know what? What exactly is this? My daughter took a statistics course in college. I said, "What are they teaching you? SPSS or SAS?" She said, "Oh no, no, no R." I'm like, you don't know what this is. Okay, grab a book, learn how to do this. Um, uh, I, I Paul, guess you I may, it's a- an interesting point. I, I'm going to just jump yes. in. Your daughter. So I have a daughter who's studying engineering, and uh, you know she's learning Python. And when I started writing this thing about a year ago, she said to me, Dad, R, oh man, Python. And, you know, so we've been debating <laughs> this. We've been debating this at the dinner table. And, you know, my, the rest right. of my family is sick of this. Hey, to make a long story short, I was trying to compute an algorithm to see whether the 4% rule works or not. What's the probability the 4% rule works? I wrote it in R. She looked at it and she said, oh man, that's so clunky. I could do it in Python faster. <laughs> Equal. It was not faster in Python. She wrote the simulation in Python. I wrote it in R, and mine was about three times faster. Well, you so know, it, for the few think, for the few geeks out there that are listening, for the few geeks, uh, R actually worked better. Well, I, I think first of all, you know, now I haven't read your book. I read the the, the description, saw you know some some listings out there. Um, a couple of reasons. Now, for, first off, it's um, very interesting language. It's free. Right. And it's based on some real powerful, you know, you, you, you're able to go out, you know, and download these amazingly free uh, open source uh, algorithms. Does this potentially like open the door to financial pl- sophisticated planning to a bunch of people who can't afford some of these more expensive software platforms? I, I think, Paul, that you're onto something, but there's something that's going to have to take place first. And that is we're going to have to raise the level of the financial planning community so that they can learn how to code these things and, and, and learn how to use these things. Because right now, what worries me is the black box mentality in retirement income planning, where you have someone that doesn't know a do loop from a for loop and says, oh, you know, Monte Carlo says that this is the right product for you. What does that even mean? How do you replicate it? Where did the numbers come from? So we need to you know, raise the overall level. I think my personal philosophy is do not rely on a piece of software where there's 150 assumptions in the background that you don't know. Write the code yourself. Now, most advisors will say, I don't have time to write code. I don't even know what that means. I got to sell. Hire someone in the office that does. Because you can't report statistics and metrics and summaries and re- without understanding where that came from or having someone on your team that does. So that's what we're trying to create in, you know, in my universe, to create the next generation of retirement income planners that will assist the charismatic people that are out there selling. But you need somebody in the office that understands this. Otherwise, I think the regulators and you know, whether it's the FINRAs and the SECs are going to go, like, what is this sales piece? What's the just – what is some – Five percent on cash. You can't turn five percent on cash. That was built into the software. You didn't know it. So, most one quick question on that because it's I again I'm a big fan as well and 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 fascinated with the work you're doing, especially on at the college level. <clears throat> so, our the folks that you're training through your courses, you said undergraduate and graduate, are they they're going out into the workforce and it sounds like you're saying that they might be ripe for to be hired potentially by some of the more experienced financial professionals who don't have this expertise or the time that um, necessary to learn how to code. Is that is would that be a you know a pathway for one of your students? That's my long. That's my five to ten year goal. So I, I think every whether it's an RIA or it's a broker dealer, everybody understands you need to be within a couple of feet of a tax expert. You're not a tax expert, but you need someone who you can bring in for a complicated time. You need someone that's within walking distance that really understands social security. I mean, you may not, you know, you kind of know, but you need someone that knows the devil in the details. I'm thinking that at some point, we're all gonna realize that you need someone who can quickly code up a numerical answer so that you can justify what it is that you're saying 
uh, and, 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 and feel confident that that's really the answer, that this annuity will help them avoid outliving their money, or that this asset allocation is the right one, or the current strategies, where do you withdraw from first, the Roth or the IRA? Or, you, know, you need someone in the office that understands the math or the coding, because otherwise, you know, you're just, I hate to say this, you're just BS. Yeah, we're, we're, listen, we're using this extensively. We've, we've kind of gotten a bunch of people internally to um, s- start to love the ability to do sophisticated analysis ourselves. So, you know, um, Mark, you know, uh, some of the data science work you've seen, you know, coming out of our product shop, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's all in our. Um, it's an interesting uh, challenge. Well, you think from like a compliance standpoint, we're kind of all modeled to say, hey, we approved this piece of software. It didn't really doesn't really matter that you know how it works as long as you're using the software and you put the numbers in. Um, well, that's why I think it's so important to be able to describe not just, uh, as Moshe said, the black box, because, you know, I, I, I everyone in the here knows, but I'll, I'll tell Moshe, I was a salesperson before I became um, a, a compliance professional. And we were using these rudimentary Monte Carlo simulations. I'm going back 20 years that were, <clears throat> I, I, honestly, in, in fairness, you know, we could attempt to try to explain how they were, uh, how, you know, how it was ultimately arrived at that this certain asset allocation model should be the preference um, or that you'll, you'll, ha- you'll live, you know, you'll have money through age 97 to borrow your, your uh, example. But um, there was a lack of, I think, true understanding. And we've talked a lot about transparency. We've talked a lot about on the show about the importance of not just selling a product, but really going deep and understanding what the objectives are. So everything that Moshe is talking about kind of points to that fundamental education, knowledge, and ability to explain at how you might arrive at a, at, a, at a particular product sale, not just start with the product sale. And Bill, just to build on what you're saying, just, just to build on it, another uh, audience for my students, or to put it this way, another place that I like to place them is in the compliance departments who are right now mostly filled with lawyers, I'm generalizing, and their knowledge of some of the underlying technical algorithms is just non-existent. I mean, I know this because, you know, I write white papers and I try to get presentations approved and I'm trying to explain to people basic Markowitz 101. No, 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 that's the fr- that's risk, that's return. And, you know, it's just not taught in law schools. So what we need to do is we need to place somebody who really technically gets it and they're the ones that they go to, hey, can you approve that? We're trying to approve this, but we don't really understand this equation. Ah, okay, here, let me explain it to you. So, and, and, and that's a huge, because everybody's got compliance. Everybody's got a chief compliance officer. Who do you lean on? I asked the chief compliance officer, when you don't quite get what this thing is about. Oh, we don't do that. We, don't. we talk to the actuaries. No, but they're in a different department. You need someone internal. So I think no. there's a, many, many places to put them. It's a great, great point, so- really, because... When it comes to anything, and I and I I'm I'm probably different from many compliance professionals, but given my background, but um, you're right. You're, you're trained with a certain a certain toolbox, and um, what you're de- what you're describing, and what we've seen across the industry in innovative um, new innovative methodologies and techniques is the the ability to understand it, and so that you're able to kind of utilize that understanding when you're doing compliance evaluations of of you know sales and other things. Look, just this whole idea of il- illustrations, you know, illustrating a product back to 1929. I-, I-, I really don't think that's valid. So what we did is we went back to 1929. It was a different world. The Federal Reserve, as we know it, didn't exist. You shouldn't be allowed to use 1932 for anything. I'm sorry. But, you know, that seems to be the standard. We went back to 1929. No, you need a forward-looking model. That's alien to an, a compliance. What, what does that mean, forward-looking model? What does that mean? Yeah. A model that looks nice? Like, what, what does that even mean? So, well, I mean, we're language. all dealing with hypothetical backcasts of performance for new indices. And I mean, don't, this is all a all new world for us to, to be able to, when you don't have actual performance on a new index, how do you, how do you, you know, how do you navigate that in this yeah, regular environment? Back, back, backcast for 1932 that didn't ever exist. Okay, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. On, on Orila, on Orila, by the way, right? As if you had liquid options on all markets at all times, right? You know, oh yeah, we had S and P 500 options in 1932. Really, Chicago Board Options Exchange or Chicago Board of Trade? Where did you get the liquid index options? And we used Black Shoals. They weren't born in 1932. It just it goes on and on. So, you, Moshe, you had mentioned the uh, the four percent withdrawal rule and that being you know one of the catalysts of, of driving you to write the code. 
you know, and that obviously seemed to be the, that, that rule seemed to be for years what people use as their baseline factor in terms of determining things. What are some of the, I guess, fundamental flaws that you see in that today, you know, as things have changed over the years? Yeah. So, Mark, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but there are six different ways to interpret the 4% rule. So I'll answer your question when you mm -hmm. tell me which one of the six you're talking about. Uh, how about inflation adjusted? Inflation adjusted what? Walk me through. I, I have $100 and I yep. go to you, Mark, and I say, Mark, I want to do a 4%. Walk me through what my life looks like for the next few years. Well, so I think that's the challenge right there. So I think fundamentally they're saying if you do an 80-20% split, equity is the fixed income, and you withdraw based on a 4% withdrawal rate, inflation adjusted, there's a X percent probability that you'll be successful. Right. So um, let's just do a numerical example, just for the sake of the audience, because I, 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 I'm this is an issue for me. This mm -hmm. means different things to different ears. So I have $100, and in the first year, I'm going to pull out $4. What happens in the second year? What happens in the second? The first year, I pull out four. What do I do in the second year, according to the 4% rule? So uh, according to the inflation-adjusted um, dynamic, of my understanding would be that you would go up 4% based on 4% plus inflation on that withdrawal rate. Okay, so give me a dollar value because my mother understands dollars and cents. Percentages aren't good. So, how much, mom? How much should she withdraw? So four dollars. Four dollars last year. So four dollars and three cents. All right. So that's what you mean by the four percent rule, because you know a lot of people interpret it as four dollar, four percent of the current value of the portfolio, as if it's an RMD, right? A lot of people interpret mm -hmm. it that way. Okay. Uh, and what do I do the next year? Just so that we make clear. So this year she pulled out 403. What's she going to do the next year? So it'd be a little over 406 because you right, take the what happens if the market, three. what happens if the market goes down 30% between this year and the next year, we've had a horrible correction. Am I still telling her to pull out the 406? I think that there's a standardized component of that that says yes, that that, and I think that's where the fundamental flaw is in that dynamic that it would stay that and it would inflation adjust off of that dollar factor. Right. So the market can go down 50%. I'm still telling mom, you pull out 406. Based, based and if, on, if, yeah. Correct. And if the S&P soars 30%, I'm telling her to pull out 406. Basically, no matter what happens in the market, I'm telling her to pull out 406. I'm telling her two years in advance already what she should do two years from now. Correct. Right. And anybody thinks that's a normal way to manage your life, to tell someone for the next 30 years, this is what you wear, no matter what the weather is, you're going to wear that sweater in April. I, I don't understand why I have to argue with people about how simplistic this rule is, but yet I've been doing it for 20 years. Ag agreed. And I think that's part of the biggest challenge with it is that it's so static in terms of what its interpretation is. Yeah. So I, I raised my hand because I felt like I had to because <laughs> like I was in class. Um, <laughs> you, did, you just hit us with the Socratic method. I, I was going to say, I said, this sounds awful Socratic. I'm familiar yeah, with it. I haven't seen that since I was in business school. Thank you. Hey, what do I do for a living? <laughs> what do I, this is... So yeah, so for, for me, when I think 4% rule, I think it's 4% it's off of what the balance is. So it's so it'd be 4% on 100 in the first year. Next year, there's like, it's it's... So that it was 96 plus whatever the return is, right, in the ensuing year, and then you withdraw 4% on that. And so what that means is that your spending budget goes up and down with the markets over time, which obviously is problematic. So that's right. my well, and that's interpretation. That's not what Mark said. That's not what Mark said. But Mark no, had we, a different interpretation. Exactly. Different. You said there's six different interpretations. We've already discovered two in a very right. short period of time. That's why I've got three chapters on this in the book because everybody sees 4% and reacts differently. And it's just about just what 4% are you talking about yeah. before we improve it, which is why I'm a big fan of intelligent drawdown rates. That's what I call it. IDD, intelligent drawdown rates. What do I mean by intelligent? Where at the beginning of the year, we look at what the market value is and we do some sort of combination of what Ramsey said and what Mark said. I've got to stick to what I did in the past because we can't have it too disruptive. On the other hand, I have to react to things. You know, endowments apply those rules. When you talk to Yale or Harvard or Stanford and you ask them, how do you decide how much to pull out of the endowment? We're in COVID, your tuitions are down. Well, what we do is a weighted average of what we did last year and where the market is now. That's a, you know, a viable strategy. So, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting to hear you talk about why it's important to have more people do this. So I, you know, I had sort of a list of questions coming into this discussion. One of them was like, well, it, you know, in your introduction, you had said that you want to 
you know, you want, you want to train more aspiring retirement quants. And so my question was, huh, how many do we need? Now you've answered the question that we need a whole lot more because there's a place for them in sales and compliance and lots of other different, uh, other different areas. And then so the next, you know, interesting piece uh, here is that, um, is that, you know, you place a very high value on, on engagement. Another word that you used in your introduction, you really want people sort of actually touching these problems and, 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 and doing the calculations themselves. And it reminded me of something that I saw in, um, in one of your tweets, you, you said, you made a comment about the Dow, uh, about the Dow being useless. And I completely agree. And, you know, in my mind, I've always felt like, you know, we have a tendency in finance as quantitative as finance is theoretically, we have a tendency in finance to rely on rules of thumb and they seem to live well beyond their their useful life. 4% rule is one, the Dow is another, and their LIBOR is another one. There's, there's lots of them. So, um, I mean, it seems to be like a very fundamental part of what you're trying to do is you're trying to sort of ask people to reconnect with the numbers regularly. So we're always making sure that we've, that we, we've essentially marked to market our, 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 our benchmark and standards. Is that a fair description? Right, you're absolutely right. There's nothing more boring to a 19 year old uh, senior at, there's nothing more boring than having an entire lecture on at what age should their grandparents take social security. Right. Okay. <laughs> and today we're doing RMDs, everyone. RMDs. Take out your calculators. RMDs. Yeah. Yeah. It is, it, it, it's, it's totally disengaged from their life. They don't even understand. So how do you make a 19-year-old or 20-year-old or 21-year-old interested in retirement and planning? Mm -hmm. You give them a coding problem. You say, look, here's the issue. Sequence of returns is the coefficient on a regression of whether you had enough money and the decades return. Oh, okay. Please run a simulation and give me the regression coefficients. Okay, that makes sense. That they know. It may make no sense to a lot of other people, but you know, we've taught them statistics, we've taught yeah. them economics. You engage them by giving them computational problems that mean something to them. They can't feel money yet, they don't have any but they can run these analyses and then they feel comfortable to then support the people that are doing the actual sales. That's my view of it. We need to make it interesting or they will drop the course and go and take a course on gender studies. Hey, that's really fun. Well, should you, do you find that those, those 19, 20, 21 year olds are, are very, very interested in this coding and running these, um, you know, this reg these regression tests and everything that you're describing? I'm stunned by the enrollment. I, I thought, okay, I'm introducing a course on pensions and retirement income planning in R. I mean, that's got the empty set, three people, and two of them are Russian mathematicians. That's what I thought I would get. And it turns out that I've got, you know, full class, 45 is R. Why? Because they're realizing, hey, I'm going to learn how to code, and that's a skill employers want. Hey, I'm going to learn something that actually uses all the statistics I've been taught, and I'm going to be very valuable to my grandparents at the kitchen table because I've heard them talk about these things, didn't really know what it means, but I can create some code to answer it. So I, it I'm a, finding success. Is it a variety of majors, like statistics majors, engineering majors, uh, you know, finance, business? Is it? Is it? Are you pulling from all these different? Uh, you know, right. so I'm, teaching, I'm teaching within a business school. So I, you know, we don't have dance majors coming in and saying, I need to know some art to complement the dance lessons. The, these are business students who are taking marketing and accounting and economics and policy and, you know, management science. And, you know, they're in their third or their, their fourth year. And they're like, I need an elective course that somehow brings us all together. Yeah. I heard about that professor Moshe guy. Yeah. Let's give it a try. So if, I, if, if I'm a, a CFP, you know, I'm, I'm mid career, this sounds intriguing. How would I, how would I get, how would I start to walk my way into this? Do I sign up for the court? Do I buy the, buy your book and take the, ta the, the course? You know, can I go lesson by lesson by myself at night? Uh, so you said mid career. Can you give me a chronological age? Oh, I'm like third. I'm, I'm 45 years old. I got a CFP. I, uh, you know, probably never saw myself doing this thing. This may be maybe my second career. I'm okay with math. Um, I certainly love conversations, but I, you know, I like doing plans for people. You know, so, you know, I, I would send you to a, you know, a calculus refresher just quickly or an algebra refresher because the book is replete with that. But if you say, no, 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 that stuff's easy for me, I, I would go through chapter by chapter. Now, Kevin, I'm not trying to sell a book here or sell a course. What I'm trying to say is I, I'm trying to convince people that this is a career that you're going to need. Uh, this is a service you're going to have to rely on. You, you probably have a healthcare specialist within reach. Uh, I hope you have uh, on speed dial a gerontologist or a, a social worker, because you know you have clients that need that. 
do you have a mathematician on speed dial, a quant on speed dial? And if the answer is, why would I need that? That's what I'm trying to convince people to do. So it's not necessarily to turn you into one, to know you need to go to them to get some answers. Because if you're trying to convince the compliance person that this annuity solves a particular problem, you better have the right metric. So um, one of the things that uh, I did is sort of went through your chapters, and I thought that there were there were a lot of uh, a lot of interesting issues in issues that you cover. You actually touched on one of them right there when you asked when you when you referenced Paul's age. You didn't you said chronological age were very specific because I know you 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 draw a distinction between chronological and biological age. That's one of sort of the top sort of three or four things I saw that were uh, interesting to me of the problems you solved. I mean, can you um, can we talk about one of them, like like whether it's secrets or returns or um, or lifetime ruin probability? There's a very interesting yeah. topic. Can you talk a little bit about how you how you you dealt with that in the chapter. Sure. So I mean, I'll I'll talk about both. I'm especially passionate about this chronological age, biological age thing. It's something that I'm learning more and more about, uh, and that is the fact that your true age, your true age, is not the number of times you circled the sun. Oh, well, I was born in 1952, and right now, no, that's just the number of times you circle the sun. What's your body's true age? And there are now tests, uh, biochemical tests, that take a look at something called your telomeres, which is the end of the chromosomes, DNA methylation, there are other methods, and they tell you your body's true age. And in the insurance industry, people nod and said, yeah, that's called underwriting. Basically, we take a look at someone and say, look, your chronological age is 65, uh, but your biological age is 52. You're, you're, you're not as old as your age and, and vice versa. I'm sure you've all met people. They're 65 years old chronologically. You know, look at them. They're not in good shape. What does that mean? They're 75 or 80 biologically. And my idea is to get people to start building financial plans that are geared towards biological age, not chronological age. So like, hey, you know, I, I'm not retiring at the age of 65 chronologically. I'm going to retire at 65 biologically. Right now, biologically, I'm 52. What should I be doing? So asset allocation has to be geared to biological age. I think pension policy, retirement policy has to be geared to biological age. Uh, you know, right now, the entire uh, retirement code, if you take a look at the IRS retirement ages, you know, at age uh, 85, the QLAC better start chronologically. At age 72, uh, RMDs chronologically. 67, full retirement age chronologically. Everything's chronological, yet we all know, come on, man, that's not my age. So the question becomes, how do you compute biological age and how do you do it in an algorithmic sense? And that's what that chapter is about, to give students the tools to take mortality tables, demographics, and convert them from chronological age to biological age. And, you know, there's a little bit of an R code there. So that's sort of where that one came from. Yeah, so, I, I'm ready for it. <laughs> Let's I'm see. Sorry? What, it again. It makes all the sense in the world. Is the world ready for it? Yeah. I get a lot of pushback from compliance. Like, I, I don't care what your biological age is. She's 62, so she is now a senior. So you better, she's 49 biologic. So yeah. it, it's going to take some time. I think you're right. I think there's sometimes a one-dimensional approach in compliance and legal, and we, and, and it oversimplifies things instead of um, recognizing many of the things you just discussed. Yeah. Um, Look, I, I envision, I envision a time in which your clients will come in and say, that's not my age. Is that on your birth certificate? That's not my age. I got tested. I am 51. Don't use that number. There's maybe not tomorrow, but 10 years from now, 15 years from now, I'm telling you, your watch will tell you how old you are today. Your Apple Watch, it'll prick you in the this invisible dot and say, Hey, good morning. You're 49. You, you, you're good. You're 49 today. I think what and you I think, think what you're people will go ahead. Yeah, I think what you're describing is just advanced underwriting to a certain extent where you're taking a look at a bunch of factors that will contribute to mortality depend you know depending on there these, these may be tests of your chromosome length and other things but really what they're trying to get at is the likelihood of you attaining a certain age isn't necessarily dependent upon your your chronological age at this point and at some point at some point somebody asks you how old you are you will no longer say your chronological age you you won't you say no nah, that's not my oh that thing the number of times i circled the sun yeah that's 62 Right. We just, as an industry, have built this great factory to protect when you will die prematurely. We just have not gotten to that point yet, Moshe, where we can predict how long you will live. <laughs> right. Which I, I, That's exactly it, because I think it's more salient. You know, when you're trying to get somebody, let's talk about annuities. Amazing. We've been doing that for a half hour. I haven't heard the word annuity. When you're trying to convince somebody to buy an annuity, here's the way not to do it. 
You know, you may become a centenarian. You know, you might live to 130. You need an annuity. What? Then you show them pictures of 130 year olds and like, oh my God, no. Right? No, that's not the way to tell, convince them to think that they're going to live a long time. The way you convince them of that is say, how old are you? 65. Are you sure you're 65? Are you, do you really know your age? You might be a lot younger than you think. Are you protected against getting younger? What happens if you're younger next year? What are you going to do then? Huh? There you got an annuity story. So, so you can so, add sales to your litany of uh, skills there. Right. So, Mosh, I was, uh, I was reading it. You do a lot of coaching as well and really try to help, um, you know, advisors and industry professionals explain their products and services better. Are there, are there some big pitfalls and challenges that you find on a regular basis that they can overcome? I, you know, I, I mean, I, I sort of fell into that. So, you know, I, I got invited, you know, back in the days when people did these things to seminars and conferences and events. And, you know, like all good speakers, I show up early because you got to be there early and you end up listening to two or three wholesalers before you actually get up to do your little pitch. So I heard a lot of presentations and like I would cringe at the end of them. I'm like, oh, my, I, got, I can't believe I have to follow this. And like, what is complexity, complexity? like you're throwing terms at people you're throwing complexity you're throwing slogans at people they didn't really understand what did i learn from that hour so to kind of break things down into simplistic you know pedagogically intuitive i think that's that's a big no-no people that uh, over complexify uh, you know just too strong a sales pitch is is obviously a no-no but you would know that um you know I, i'm here to educate i'm here to i want to teach you three things you didn't know an hour ago and then to sort of implicitly, you know, get some ideas in there that'll help sales, uh, you know, let alone lacking rigor, you know, where'd that number come from? And, and that makes no sense. And, you know, th th things like that. I mean, it's, it's common sense. You do know probabilities have to add up to one, right? You can't have a 90% and a 70% and a six. You do, I mean, basic things. Yeah, I saw, I saw a clip uh, recently that, that you had done a while back that talked about um, successful retirement planning and four principles, and those being addition, subtraction, division, and multiplication. I thought it was really interesting how you broke it down that simplistically uh, in terms of things that people really sh should be conscious of. Yeah, yeah let's go. Link it to things that are, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no. Well, I, I actually have a question, you know, just kind of going back to what your comment about 1932. Why are we using 1932 in our calculations in a world that didn't even exist at the point in time? Well, if we flip the switch and said, okay, let's look at 2032 and, and take sort of a forward look, uh, God, what, what, what a mess we're in today. You know, where, where, where do we start? Now, I know as a human, I tend to overestimate the good. I overestimate the bad. So if, we, if you start to look through the, the, the changes in the assumptions that we should start to think about that are permanent, you know, not temporary, how, how do we think of, you know, dramatically lower interest rates, um, unemployment, um, change, you know, fundamental changes in the economy, fundamental changes in terms of where we want to live, right? It sounded great to live in a nice retirement center as of February 28th, mm. come March 1st, keep me away. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like jail. Yeah. How much, yeah. how much of this world do you think will shift how we, um, sh and, the, and the numbers we should be using in, in some of these assumptions? Yeah. So, you know, uh, as I say to people, when they ask me, questions that are of first order importance, which is what you're asking me. You know, th th these are really major issues, not, not the sort of minutia of what correlation coefficient did you use? You know, these are, what is it? Look, I'm just a guy at a bar now. I'm just somebody that you're talking to and I'm like, I, you know, I don't know, it's my opinion. It, I, I have no deep insight into what the year 2030 is going to look like. And, and nobody does, nobody does. But what I do believe in is robustness of sensitivity assumptions. So. What assumptions did you make when you gave someone a financial plan? And how can we shake it up to take into account what we learned in the last six months or in the last 12 months? So th that's sort of what I look at. Not so much, what are you predicting for the year 2030? How do we shake up the internal assumptions in your model so that we can account for that fact that the future is gonna look very different present? So this, this gives me 99% chance of success. Okay, that sounds good. But what if interest rates stay zero for the next you know, 10 years? And what if negative nominal rates continue forever? Ah, now it's not a 90% success rate. Now it's only 60. Okay, then I may want to change my behavior. 
So uh, when I say I don't think 1932 is relevant, what I'm trying to say is that the information that you're extracting from 1932 isn't going to be as important as the information that we extract from 2020. You're all speechless. Yeah. So, all right, well, why don't we, can we go we're back to- we're, we're, uh, Yeah, we're frightened at the 60% probability, Moshe. Right. <laughs> you know what? The margin of error on these things are atrocious. I, I mean, I don't know, you know, I ask you, how many simulations did you run? Oh, 500. Thousand? No, 500. Like, oh my God, like, how can you learn anything from 500 simulations when you have 25 underlying variables? Like, stats 101. Uh, yes, I've seen situations where 90 becomes 60 when you shake up assumptions a little bit, which is, by the way, why I'm a big fan of annuities. I know this sounds ridiculous. You know, when somebody says, you know, an RIA, I hate annuities, Ken Fisher, and I only do. That's okay. Why do you think this is the right plan, a systematic withdrawal? Because we ran a Monte Carlo 97%. Then I say, please go back and change the correlation coefficient to negative. Please go back and assume negative nominal returns for 10 years. Please go back and invert the yield curve. Please go back and say, now what number did you get? Well, half the time they don't respond. But when they do, the, oh, we got 60%. Oh, okay. So you're saying 90 and 60. That's not good. What happens if you just buy an annuity for the guaranteed portion of the portfolio or, or she needs this amount of income? What happens if you just buy a QLAC or a DIA? Did the numbers look better regardless of assumptions? Yeah, they did, Moshe. All right, there you go. The point was not necessarily to come up with a number, but to convince you that this product will help. So in one of the white papers you wrote, you indicated that about a third of retirees don't know how much money they could spend on a monthly basis. And that if they tried to put some basic math behind it, that would go up to 50%. Like what are some of the biggest pitfalls that they try to calculate into that that caused that percentage to be so high? I'm, I'm, I'm surprised I would have said something like that, but I don't know, maybe it was a while ago. And you know, as you get older, you forget these things, but I am not surprised at the number of people that have no sense of what their needs are gonna be five or 10 years from now. Um, you know, this whole exercise in budgeting, I, I, I think spreadsheets have turned us into, you know, some people who think that we somehow can figure out what we're going to need 29 years from now. So now this is your rent for the next 30 years, column H, and this is going to be your Medicare premiums or Medicare column J. And, and look at that, there's a gap. So we need to, I don't think you can predict with, with any degree of certainty, uh, what expenses are going to be. And I think you have to adapt. So I, I, it's, it's a tough exercise. It's a, it's a tough exercise. I have no idea if I'm answering your question, but mm -hmm. it, it's tough to estimate what, uh, what you're going to need. Agreed. So um, one of the things that, that um, I've spent a lot of time following that you've talked about has been, um, you know, has been tontines and, and other sort of other interesting ways. I'm sorry, ways I'm sorry what? I'm sorry, Tontines. What? Just to say, what's that? I, is this now Socratic method? <laughs> I don't know. You're assuming everybody listening to you knows what that oh, word okay. sounds like. I, I heard on a that's fair. episode, I heard that once. What is that? That's fair. Well, maybe, maybe, I mean, reframe my question. Um, so we're, we're going into an environment where we, we, um, we, we, we know interest rates are currently low and there's a lot of indication that may, they may remain low for some time to come. And the one thing that you can get from a um, from from an annuity, from a life annuity, you can get mortality credits, right? And another way to get mortality credits is through a tontine. So in some sense, I'm I am neutral. I'm neutral to what the tool is, but it's very clear to me mortality credits are sort of this remaining this this one residual place where you can get some you can get some yield. And fortunately, it's it's uncorrelated to everything else in the market. So the question is to steal to steal a term from Tom Hagner. It's the last alpha. Got it. Okay. So the question is, what do we do going forward? Because it's I'm I'm of the view that interest rates could go negative, right? So what can we do? What can we do going forward? Whether it's tontines or whether it's whatever it happens to have to be. Let's. What do you think we should be focusing on in this industry in the next couple of years to? factor in that we're likely to have, um, uh, not have forgiving yields, if you will. Is the answer. Pools, swimming pools. 
That, yeah. that's, that, that's the way I look at it. We need to learn how to pool our resources mm -hmm. in order to make our money last for the rest of our lives. Now, that's very dangerous because it sounds like letting governments take all our money and they'll, they'll deal with the reallocation. Mm -hmm. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that we have to take groups of people and put them together and they have to enter into agreements to share. So you and me and a couple of other people who are the same age biologically get together and say, look, we're going to buy a bond portfolio and we're going to share coupons for as long as we live. And Ramsey, if you live a longer time than me, you'll get the coupons. And, and if I live longer than you, I'll get the coupons. But if we all go out and buy our own bonds, we'll never have enough because interest rates are negative. But if we pool our resources and agree to share that way, the mortality credits, which you just noted, will give a subsidy to the negative interest rate, and we're going to have enough for the rest of our lives. So my perspective is, it's not about the annuity or the tontine or the longevity insurance. Can we pool our resources in an efficient way, in a tax efficient way, so that we can take our chips and make them last longer? So this is, this is the... This is the one of the elements of the life insurance industry that I feel like the general public doesn't necessarily understand. They understand, they understand maybe that like that there's, there's investments that are behind products, but at the end of the day, like being a trusted place for the formation of a pool is actually one of the fundamentally, you know, value, so uniquely valuable elements of the life insurance industry. Cause I can't think of too many other places where you go, where you would do that. Right. Like you have to trust the pool. Sorry. Ramsey, why can't Vanguard or Fidelity do that? Why do I need an insurance company? I, and I'm, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be combative or adversarial. Sure. Why, why do we need an insurance company? All we need is you know, a large enough company to pool us together. Why do I need an insurance license? I'm Skin not guaranteeing the game. anything. I'm Skin sorry. in the game. Because, because any, other, any, other, any other pool that's just a, if you, would, if, if you will, is a, um, a, a My vessel. local golf club. My local golf club. I get together with you know, 80 other golfing buddies who are of the same biological age. I say, all right. Let's go buy some treasury bonds in a declining pattern so that okay. we have a stable income. And, you know, whoever's alive, gets, what skin, why do I need skin in the game? Well, you need skin in the game and you need actually, you need a good administrator. So you need, you need either a, an organization, an entity or a system that will manage, manage those assets and will manage the payouts and monitor, right, who's alive and who's not, you know, from now until the till, till the last person dies what insurance so, companies already I, are I, doing exactly yeah. so like yeah. i i haven't been able to find another entity or type of company that meets all those that meets all those standards just by definition of walking into in, into the office every day so that's black that, rock. that's my view keep keep your eye on black rock keep your eye on fidelity they're, they're yeah. sitting there they're listening to your pitch and they're saying i still haven't heard why i need an insurance license and capital and reserve requirements I, yeah. i'll get the actuaries yeah i'll get somebody why do I need the insurance structure, state regulation, 5200? Why do I need state? Re we'll do all of that. I, I think Again, it's a tail risk. Who's, listen, who's going to cover the tail risk, though? Well, who's going to cover the tail, tail risk? We're going to adjust the payouts every year based on survival. We're not guaranteeing well, look, anything. Well, my, my, my yeah. grandmother belonged to this burial society. Like, wow. You know, she was born in 1897. You know, talk about longe you know, longevity. Yeah, she'd get a little card every every month, write the checks in, right? Last person stand, uh, you know, they'd already folded by the time she passed away. She, outla she outlived the funeral society. <laughs> but no, it's a good question. Will, what, what's her, I cannot think of a reason why you couldn't do this as a private entity, right? Well, I think, you know, well, what I was trying to get at when I, when I said that, I, I don't think there's, there's probably, I mean, I, take a look at, um, who is it? Bill Ackman's new SPAC is called Pershing Square Tontine Holdings. So, I mean, people are latching onto this that are not in insurance, and certainly he's not, um, yeah. you know, as a hedge fund. But, but I think that to, to to Moses' point, there, there are people looking at it saying, "Whoa, whoa! Insurance companies can do a lot. They can take your money and invest it in all these different creative ways, um, and then you know, guarantee you lifetime income." And they're relying on a risk pool, just like what, just like what we've been talking about, and all these things. So. There is a component that historically insurance companies have been doing this. This has been kind of the, I guess, the, the realm of what insurance companies do. Um, well, along with that comes an awful lot of regulation and a lot of other kind of challenges. So I, I wouldn't, you know, in this, in this kind of evolving environment, I would not surprise me if you saw other um, entities you know, you mentioned Fidelity and BlackRock, and I have no knowledge of those, um, but looking at this saying, 
this is one of our biggest problems. We've talked about this on so many episodes, the, the, the mortality risk of outliving your money and how do we solve for this? And we were, uh, we had a guest recently, um, um, the, the uh, former commissioner of Iowa talked about Tontine. You know, it was like, not, this is not the first kind of foray into this concept that we've talked about. And I think that the industry is paying attention and that there is a, um, a longevity risk that everyone recognizes with the lack of pensions that folks have and the need for uh, a form of income stream, a component of your, of your portfolio to, to float you. So, so to answer your question, Paul, um, the insurance companies have the luxury that because that's what they're doing now, risk cooling, but I don't think that it's, yeah. it's out of the question to suggest others would try. No, well, hey, listen, we're really close to time here, uh, and Moshi, thank you so much, you know, for coming on our show. Um, if fi final thoughts or questions, Mark? I guess if, if I'm an agent in the field listening, um, you know, what are, what what are three main things in terms of bringing into the conversation with a client that you would advise? Yeah, you know, that 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 is shifting as 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 this world changes. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Look, I, I think that, and, and I'm going to try to mention three things off the top of my head that we haven't talked about. So, you know, everything we've talked about is obviously, mm -hmm. I, I think a word that we haven't heard yet is inflation, or at least I don't remember it in the last half hour. And the idea that inflation for the elderly and retirees is different than inflation for the rest of the population and what the Fed looks at. You know, when you take a look at what your typical 90 year old is buying, it's not, you know, technology that has been reduced in price. It's, it's services that are probably increasing. So ga gaining an awareness of inflation and the fact that having an inflation adjusted income linked to your own inflation is very important. So I, I think that's number one. If I'm in the field and I want to sound different and I want to pitch a product that grows over time, I'm talking about unique inflation. I think that would be number one. Uh, another one that we did not discuss, and this is extraordinarily important, uh, is cognitive decline, you know, dementia, Alzheimer's, uh, to protect yourself against yourself. How do I protect myself against myself? That I'm not going to be able to make great investment decisions, you know, 10, 20, 30 years down the line. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm in my 50s. I love asset allocation. Sit at the end of the month with my spreadsheet, stocks, bonds, Europe, emerging markets, more bonds. I, I'm not going to be able to do that at 80 or 90. So I need to automate things and to tell people that are extremely active now to try to imagine themselves in the future, cognitive decline. I think that's an important one. Uh, and the other one, I mean, you know, this, this notion of, uh, you know, financial literacy and who do you trust in your family to help you out uh, when, uh, when that day comes. So, I mean, these are not necessarily annuity related conversations, but sure. if you're in the field and you're talking to individual people, these are things you want to have conversations about. And uh, I think that leads nicely to annuities, but it's certainly conversations we didn't have in the last 45 minutes. Yeah, a I trusted agree. family member. Great, thank you. Yeah, Moch, this has been fascinating. I mean, there's many, many um, offshoots of this conversation where we could go. Um, and your perspective, you know, as, a, as an expert in the field and a professor really brings a lot to bear. And perhaps at some point in the future, you'd come back because uh, I thoroughly enjoyed today's conversation. Yeah, sure. Friends, delighted to come back. Delighted to come back. I, I'm, I, I've been here for six months, so I can come back anytime. <laughs> All right, <laughs> Ramsey. You want to yeah. Bring some? So thanks so much. Thanks for uh, thanks for challenging us. That was uh, interesting, and I and do hope you can come back sometime soon to 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 challenge us some more on, on many fronts. Um, so many many takeaways. Um, one one you just said, which I think is which is really important, is this idea of the the, the trusted the, the trusted um, financial advisor that's within the family. I actually even created a, a marketing persona for that person because I think that person is really real and I've run into that person many times. Um, and then the next piece is this idea of pooling. I think that, I, I think that we need to really focus on, on, on pooling, as a, pooling as an asset. I think it's interesting to see to what extent it can actually be practical and thrive outside of the, where we only seem to see it right now, which is in the context of, of the insurance business. I mean, obviously we see it in social security and defined benefit pension plans, but that's right. That's either dead or separate, right? Um, but in private, in, in, in private industry, it'll be interesting to see to which, to what extent it can be replicated. You know, the pooling piece by itself can be replicated. So I, I, I would love to, to follow up on that topic on a going forward basis. And again, thank you for coming today. Yeah, sure. yeah. my pleasure. Hey, thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks, thanks for listening to our show. Please subscribe, like us, uh, recommend us to your friends, and uh, join us again for another episode next week of That Annuity Show.
Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed the show, please rate and recommend us on iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also get more information at thatannuityshow.com. Thank you.